What's one of the biggest reasons that Christianity in Western cultures has declined over the last 200 years? The Trojan horse of deep time, today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now today we're going to be talking about, well the title is, The Trojan Horse of Deep Time. How right. Deep Time Infiltrated the Church over, uh, well, quite a while ago. Right. Um, it, it's going to be a little bit different. This article, this, uh, this uh, show is actually based on an article that you did, Cal. Right, right. Uh, by the same name. And it outlines the collapse of biblical authority in the Western world, in Christianity in the Western That's world. Right. Uh, and, and, and why that happened in a, in a story-like fashion. So we'll go through that story with the analogy of the Trojan horse. Right. In, in the famous tale from, from Homer's Odyssey, the fortress of Troy was defeated by the Greek army uh, by leaving a large wooden horse, of course, secretly filled mm -hmm. with, with uh, soldiers behind as a supposed gift. And the Trojans willingly took it into their gates, allowing, the, of course, the hidden force inside to, to, to take over the the fortress, right? And, and defeat the, uh, the army that was inside the fortress. Yeah, today a Trojan horse, that's used as an, an analogy, it's a metaphor to symbolize a strategy uh, that allows an enemy to infiltrate and defeat a seemingly invincible foe. Right. A Trojan horse strategy and so on. It also often implies that uh, if it wasn't for obvious reasons of pride or inattentiveness, right on the part of the victim, the ploy wouldn't have succeeded. So there, it works on multiple levels there. Right. In other words, the injured party uh, should have known better. That's, that's the bottom line. Right. Now what we're going to do in this story is use it as an analogy to what happened to the church in once great Christian nations. Exactly. I mean, if you think of the Western church, even up to maybe 100 years ago, as a, as a strong fortress, right? Towers proudly displaying banners of faith, uh, her watchman trumpeting the call, announcing the salvation available for sinners because of Christ's sacrifice. Uh, think of how the church, church used to send streams of emissaries uh, around the world, uh, winning souls, breaking yes. down strongholds, freeing captives, defeating the enemy on his own ground. Um, Christian soldiers armed with the sword of the Spirit, boldly uh, championed the, the cause of Christ, made inroads across the globe. Uh, on her home ground, uh, Christian leaders taught God's Word boldly so that men and women of God raised godly children um, so that there, there were more believers, right? Uh, raised up just as the Scripture commanded. And of course, God's Word was proclaimed uh, as the ultimate authority over man in, in the Western world countries. Yeah, the church was once like a fortress, like this fortress of Troy and so on. Her towers proudly displaying banners of faith, her watchmen trumpeting the call, announcing salvation available because of Christ's sacrifice. And now, right. the story's different. It's completely different today. Uh, the fortress is being assailed from all sides including assaults from within, <laughs> right. uh, unfortunately. Uh, her soldiers are often ill-equipped for attack or defense uh, for both uh, both those. Wolves are in the fold and infighting is commonplace, mm -hmm. unfortunately. That's what we find in churches today. Uh, many collaborate with the enemy and vast numbers have abandoned the post and uh, freely joined the enemy's camp. The authority of God's word is openly questioned, even within its own walls. The proclamation of the gospel is hindered and the trumpet's clarion call is unclear. You know, t today has as, as always been the main battleground for the church is the concept of biblical authority. So yes. if the, if the biblical, yeah. Bible doesn't have to mean what it plainly says, then obviously it can, it can be interpreted to mean whatever the reader wants it to. And so, so therefore, fallible man becomes the authority over God's uh, revealed right. truth. Yeah. So we'd expect non-believers to question the authority of God's Word. But if a professing believer lacks confidence in the Bible, then, of course, double-mindedness is what you're going to get. Okay, so, so what happened? There's, there's been a change. What mm -hmm. happened? Christians understand from the Bible that there's a real enemy that prowls around seeking to destroy and devour. That's, that's Satan. The Bible talks about Satan. The Bible describes Satan as both extremely intelligent and sly. Right. Um, undoubtedly, he knew a frontal attack to discredit God's word would not likely be successful. That right. would raise the... the be too obvious. It'd be too obvious, yeah. A better strategy would be to concoct a plan to do it secretively, to, uh, to unlock the gates from within and allow doubt to creep in and confusion to come pouring in. And uh, that idea would not uh, cause obvious offense. 
um, uh, or, or attack the church's perceived main tenets, such as the cross. You attack the cross and all the, uh, all the Christians the are going to fight stuff. back. Yeah? Of course, yeah. Uh, something that would be attractive to man's intellect, right. but not trigger the alarms. Any idea that would seem totally, you need an idea that se seems harmless and, and separate from theology, something like that right. uh, would be quietly accepted. Right. And what was that idea? We'll find out when we get back. <laughs> A question people often ask is, does the Bible mention dinosaurs? You might expect that the Bible would mention the most impressive land-dwelling beasts of God's creation, since He created them on day six along with people. Indeed, in Job chapter 40, God directs Job to consider the crowning glory of His creation, behemoth, as testimony to His creative power. Behemoth is described as a colossal beast, feeding on grass like an ox and living in marshes, with great strength in its loins and power in the muscles of its belly. Its bones are like tubes of bronze, and it has a tail that sways like a cedar. Certainly not a hippopotamus or an elephant, which have tails like a small piece of rope. The description in Job is consistent with the huge sauropod dinosaurs found in the fossil record, such as Apatosaurus or Brachiosaurus, which now appear to be extinct, but were still alive at the time of Job. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. If you just tuned in, we're talking about, well, the title is The Trojan Horse of Deep Time, how deep time infiltrated the church slowly, like the, using the metaphor of the Trojan horse, right. kind of the way it happened. You know, in the late 1700s, the idea of millions of years started to become popularized in Western yes. academia, and this idea was, you know, wasn't a result of radioisotope dating or... or uh, it was long the, before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It came through ideas um, because of the sedimentary rocks, how they were yes. interpreted, right? Yep. Now, the concept was easy, uh, simple and easy to teach and understand. You know, if you get a layer or two of sedimentary uh, deposition per year, if you added up all the layers you've seen, it must have taken millions of years to put those things down, and sure. people could get that that concept pretty quickly. And yeah. That, changed yep. the way they thought. The idea of deep time is, uh, di didn't seem offensive to many in the church. So that, that's one of the strategies of, oh, look right. at this cute horse here, let's yeah. take it in. <laughs> uh, and, and church leaders, it, it didn't attack the lordship of Christ. It didn't, it, it didn't have any connection to morals or values. It was just reinterpreting the rocks. It seems pretty right. harmless. And, and it was popularized by men of science. And all these guys are studying this. And there was a respectability. Upstanding citizens and so on were promoting this. And, and they seemed friendly to the church. Yep. Many of them were, were you know, friends of the church. And, they, and, and what they proposed seemed logical. It was, it was a sophisticated argument, you know. Mm -hmm. And technical methods, the, the technical methods seemed fairly reasonable. It was a reasonable argument. By and large, the church accepted the concept of an old earth as intellectually and scientifically sound. Right. That's what happened. And as these ideas became more popular, theologians started to figure out how to fit millions of years into the Bible. That right. became the next challenge. And after all, there were many clever and sophisticated uh, ways that could be devised to allow millions of years to be fit into Genesis. Uh, you've got the gap theory, day age, a tranquil flood, um, Genesis 1 to 11 as a localized creation, uh, etc. There's many other ideas. They were all proposed as viable options for reinterpreting the scripture to get in the millions of years. And, 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 and the trap was sprung at that point. Exactly, because these people had failed to realize that by taking the bait of millions of years of earth history uh, versus the biblical account, what they'd actually given up is the concept of biblical authority. Yes. You don't have yep. to take the Bible as plainly written. So the gates of infallibility themselves had been unlocked from within by the defenders of the faith themselves, and, and the doors get pushed open and, and allowing doubt to flood in. Basically, that's what happened. Mm. Uh, saying scripture should be interpreted according to what scientists conclude about history, conceded that science, which which is really conclusions about history by fallible men based on naturalistic right. assumptions, yeah. ha had more authority than God's Word. And even though it was plain to see that Genesis and the relevant supporting verses uh, throughout the Bible uh, supported a recent creation in a young earth, yes. um, what, basically what they'd announced is that the Bible wasn't the final authority, uh, of course simultaneously declaring it was, but really it wasn't, people right. could figure that yeah. out. And uh, you know, this, this publicly stood against what the teaching of the church fathers, what the reformers, and, and th these guys had overwhelmingly believed Genesis declared that the earth was young. And, um, you know, so that's why you started to see declarations from champions of biblical inerrancy uh, like the, fo uh, the following become common. Um, 
It is of course admitted that taking this account, Genesis, by itself, it would be most natural to understand the word day in its ordinary sense. But if that sense brings the Mosaic account into conflict with facts, millions of years, of course, is what he's saying, and in another sense avoids such conflict, then it's obligatory on us to, to, to adopt the other. Now, in doing so, what they're admitting is that beliefs from outside Scripture should be used to reinterpret the Bible. Right. And uh, it, it, Genesis 1 to 11 began to be looked at as an instructive story rather than true history. Right. And this quickly was, was noticed and capitalized on by the enemies of the church. Right. Uh, Darwin's bulldog, as, as his nickname was, Thomas Huxley yeah. said this, if Adam may be held to be no more real a personage than Prometheus, and if the story of the fall is merely an instructive type comparable to the profound Promethean myth mythos, what value has Paul's dialectic? And what about the authority of the writers of the books of the New Testament who on this theory have not merely accepted flimsy fictions for solid truths, but have built the very foundations of Christian dogma upon legendary quicksands? Yeah, he figured it out very quickly. Yeah. I mean, allowing the Earth's age to be of vast antiquity, then God's fortress now fell victim to numerous assaults, right, from within and without. See, if the fossil record with all its recorded death and suffering occurred millions of years prior to Adam's sinning, then God must have used death to create which creates all sorts of questions. It, it couldn't have been Adam's sin that uh, allowed death and suffering into the creation. What was Jesus to save us from then, yes. right? Yeah. So how could a Christian answer, you know, why is there so much pain and suffering in, in the world if, if a good God used death and disease and cancer to create? I mean, how do you determine which parts of the Bible are true? This was the, yeah. the seed yeah. that was sown, and we're going to see the damage that that caused as we get back. What are the theological consequences of adding millions of years to Genesis? How does it impact doctrines such as the gospel, sin, the atonement? Refuting compromise is the most powerful biblical and scientific defense of a straightforward view of Genesis. Loaded with scientific support for a recent creation in six real days, it demolishes all attempts to twist the biblical text in order to insert millions of years, bringing clarity into an area usually mired in confusion. Must reading for Bible college students and anyone involved in church leadership or teaching. Get your copy at creation.com. Okay, in this week's segment, we're talking about, uh, or episode, we're talking about the Trojan horse of deep time. Yes, one of the principal tools in this uh, strategy was to undermine God's word. Uh, to undermine God's word was um, uh, it was a Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell was uh, was a major player here. Lyell was an anti-Christian lawyer, an amateur geologist, and um, he used his reinterpretation of the geological data and he used that to attack the authority of Scripture. In his own words to friends and colleagues, we can clearly see that he understood what he was doing. He had a right. strategy. He said this, I conceived the idea five or six years ago, that would have been in 1824 or 25, that if ever the mosaic geology could be set down without giving offense, it would be an historical sketch. And you must abstract mine in order to have as little to say as possible yourself. Let them feel it and point the moral. Right. He's talking to a friend of his, Paulette Scrope, and he's saying, look, yeah. just, just show them this is different history, and then, then they'll feel what the effect is on, on yeah. their, their Bible. Yeah. He, he knew that there was going to be some resistance from the church, but trusted that if he was careful enough not to cause offense, and if he appealed to the intellectual aspects of his now largely disregarded geological ideas, he could actually get help from those inside the church to, to undermine, mm. and, and he'd actually use compromising clergy to accomplish his goal. He said this, if we don't irritate, which I fear that we may, though mere history, we shall carry all with us. If we don't triumph over them, but complement the liberality and candor of the present age, the bishops and enlightened saints will join us in despising both the ancient and modern physical theologians. It is just the time to strike, so rejoice, sinner that you are, the quarterly review a publication which he was trying to get his ideas into is open to you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just blatant what yeah. he, he He's was the guy that's pushing the horse through the gates. You got it. You know, <laughs> it's Lyle's concept of overthrowing the geological conclusions outlined in Moses' writings. That's the global flood. Yeah. Uh, were, it was very successful, and that paved the way for Darwinian evolution. You need millions of years in place before you can have Darwinian evolution, because right. evolution takes millions of years. The Western world was forever changed, the church was changed, and while many Christians seem not to understand what happened, honest Bible skeptics admit this. 
Yeah. Uh, E.O. Wilson, here's a, a, a skeptic. I myself have little doubt that in England it was uniformitarian long ages, in, uh, geology, and the theory of evolution that changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. Here's a skeptic that right. understands how this Trojan horse worked. Right. Compromising God's words with man's fallible ideas doesn't help the cause of Christ. No. <laughs> Lyle's <laughs> ideas of uniformitarian geology were, are, uh, they're widely dismissed as illegitimate by modern geologists, right? right? And yet his faulty ideas were allowed to creep in virtually unchallenged into the stronghold of biblical authority. You know, nobody, yeah. not too many people believe them today, but they worked back then. The watchmen should have identified these ideas. They, they don't match up to God's word. They should have sounded the alarm, right? Yeah. Yeah. Men like Charles Darwin knew exactly how to attack the church, and yet very few in the church seem to discern it, or even today. You know, mm -hmm. look at these quotes from Darwin. This is in a letter to, he sent to his son, who also was undermining the church as okay. he, he'd learned from his father. This is Darwin's word. Lyle is most firmly convinced that he has shaken the faith in the Delugian com company far more efficiently than never having said a word against the Bible than if he had acted otherwise. So he, he, totally, he knew completely what he was doing. He yep. knew that by undermining the flood and promoting millions of years, it undermined biblical authority. Exactly. And he, and he uh, admitted that the best way to undermine Christianity was to do so slowly with side attacks. He right. said this, right. I've lately read Morley's Life and Voltaire, and he insists strongly that directly the direct attacks on Christianity, even when written with the wonderful force and vigor of Voltaire, produce little permanent effects. Real good seems only to follow from slow and silent side attacks. Wow. He, he, and that's, that's Darwin. Right? That's Darwin. That's actually Darwin. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. he also said in the same letter, Stuart Mill never expressing his religious convictions as he was urged never to do by his father. Both agreed strongly that if he had done so, he would never have influenced the present age in the manner in which he has done. His books would not have been textbooks at Oxford. He's referring to another person where his dad said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't attack the Bible. Just, yeah, just, yeah. Just, just introduce these things that go against the Bible as an intellectual thing. And these are textbooks that became, were, were in Oxford. Yeah, amazing. So these Bible skeptics were not only devising ways to undermine Christianity, uh, but were doing it with a network of people and teaching it to their sons. That's it, exactly. We have a multi-generational effect going on. Yeah. Uh, just incredible. The Trojan horse of deep time. Deep right. time has slipped in. And the church today, most of the church, has bought it. More when we come back. When most people hear the word explosion, they often think of destroyed buildings and injured people. But geologists have long recognized a different type of explosion in Earth's sedimentary rocks known as the Cambrian explosion. Cambrian rocks are a group of rocks found around the world in which we find fossils of many of the major animal groups. This is significant because pre-Cambrian rocks found below the Cambrian don't generally contain much fossil material. But then in the Cambrian, there are fossils in abundance. In fact, this transition is so dramatic that some call it the Cambrian Big Bang. But probably the most devastating impact of the Cambrian explosion is the damage it does to evolutionary ideas, even with evolutionary dating notions. Since most major animal groups appeared suddenly in the fossil record without ancestors, the idea that all life evolved slowly over time becomes very hard to swallow. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right. Our subject today is the Trojan horse of deep time. Using the analogy of Troy and the Trojan horse that, uh, that destroyed Troy there, the soldiers came out. Uh, we've been talking about deep time and right. how that has been slipped into the church and um, it has destroyed the church a to, crippling a, to a large extent. A crippling effect. People's yeah. faith, yeah. To rebuild. What, what do we do? To, let, let's make some headway here. Let's yeah. turn around and to rebuild the concept of biblical authority, first of all, we have to know that what God's word plainly says. That we, we start there. Read scripture daily. Trust it. Uh, uh, Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. That's a key verse in this Very issue. Key. Let's just trust God and follow what the Bible says and everything else is secondary. Right. What we allow into our minds has to be filtered by the word of God before we accept anything. 
Um, Romans 12, 2 reminds us about this, uh, that we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds to test and discern what is acceptable to God. Then we will know if what script someone says matches scripture and be accepted or whether it should be rejected. We're supposed to think differently as Christians. <laughs> we're not supposed to accept the same presuppositions, the same axioms that the rest of the world accepts. Right. Uh, that, that's the foundation of our faith. If, if we do that, we can d develop a strong foundation based on God's Word. Yeah, yeah. And, and we can be strong and unwavering. Right? That's right. Yep. Not only are we to uh, not accept man's authority over God's, but we're to defend the authority of God's Word, right? So we, yes. we believe it, but then we need to defend it. We need to attack concepts that try to come against it. First Peter 3.15 declares that Christians should always have a ready defense for their faith, yes. but that yeah. they should honor Christ in their hearts as Lord over all. And, and in fact, we should, we should love the Lord with all our hearts, with all our strength, with all our soul, and with all our mind, you know. Um, and and uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, uh, we're to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. You know, sometimes people are like, well, well I believe what I believe, and I believe the Bible, and, and that's great. You're supposed to believe the Bible. Yeah. But there are people that are challenging the Bible, and you need to challenge their interpretation. You need to question them. You need to destroy those strongholds. You need to destroy those arguments. That's, that's an offensive position in a sense. Yeah, right? and maybe not for your own faith. For those viewers who have a solid faith and evolution in millions of years really doesn't affect it, that's great. That's what yeah. we all want to be. But what about a relative? What about a family member that's strayed from the faith? What about, what about kids? What, what about, about kids? Yeah, that, they're being affected by these things, and you as a believer need to get some arguments going there, teach them to think biblically, uh, and, and so on. So beware of Greeks bearing gifts. That's the <laughs> ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate uh, uh, warning there. Uh, the concept of millions of years has caused incredible damage to the church, to the fortress of infallibility. Uh, many Christians simply want to fight the ills of society, like abortion and same-sex marriage and right. so on. Uh, but, but um, and, and they think the